Thank you, sir. Since we're on a little bit of a time clock. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the visitors we have in the back. I want to go ahead and bring the Finance and Planning Committee meeting to order. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who came. We're on a little bit of a short clock today. We have another meeting coming in here at 3 o'clock, so we need to shut down by about 5 of to be ready for the, the next conversation. Uh, one disclaimer statement for public meetings, just for the record. Uh, official recordings, videos, or transcriptions of the HSV Property Owners Association committee meetings and or board meetings will be done by authorized personnel only and can be viewed on the HSV Property Owners Association YouTube channel and explorethevillage.com. Any other recording, video, or transcription of the Property Owners Association committee meetings and or board meetings is not considered the official record. So thank you for that. Uh, next item on the agenda was review and approval of the previous minutes. There was a small correction uh, based on the review that Kathy put out the board minutes a few days ago. I think Tom had a small comment to that. I think that's been corrected. Is that correct, Kathy? Yes. Okay. Yes. In the reserves and investment policy paragraph, the first sentence I added emergency reserve policy, and then the last sentence. Carl will also work on a draft of a working reserves policy. Okay. And I cool. think that was done correctly. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. And so, Melissa, anybody else has any other comments to the minutes? I'd ask for a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. Thank you very much. And then uh, there were couple of items on the agenda for this afternoon. Uh, the biggest one is the review of the 22 fee schedules. But uh, the first item was have a, uh, a short conversation, I hope, on the uh, red line reserve policy document that we've been working on. And Carl, I really appreciate all of your efforts to take everybody's comments and, and kind of drive them together. Uh, did not know if there was anything else that we needed to put on the agenda today. Um, I don't know that we do or don't want to discuss the budget uh, guidance mm -hmm. draft that you know we're working on now. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We can discuss that. We can uh, not discuss it. I mean, generally, I think the fees thing is probably the most critical. So. Yeah, I, I I agree. So let me suggest this, and if it doesn't resonate with folks, peace. Uh, got quite a bit of commentary on the on the budget guidance for 22. We're a little late to need on that one since the budget's already in process. So it's kind of a writing the uh, kind of writing the documentation after we design the product at this point. So put out a, a draft for review earlier today on email. Let me suggest that anybody who has any comments on that. On that cut, just get them back to me by, let's say, COB Friday, whatever day that is, 23, 27th, is that what it is? Uh, and then we'll take whatever feedback is there and we'll we'll pass it to Karina. We'll have it on file for, for uh, uh, 22. And then uh, we'll try to make sure we put this on the F&P calendar early enough in 23 that we don't get caught behind the power curve next time. Sure. That makes sense. So yeah. Unless anybody has any objections to that, I'll just well, I'll take that as an action item. People can give me whatever inputs they have, yeah. and I'll I'll close that out. So, uh, so the other one was the reserve policy and the fee schedules. Uh, anything else to put on the agenda? If not, let me just say this. Uh, I, well, I looked at your budget guidance. Uh, mm -hmm. draft and and I don't think there's anywhere on there we're stepping on anything that's on there so yeah we're, we've looked at it and followed it pretty well yeah I, I think you have John absolutely I just you know we're, we're kind of to the point where the ships already sailed you guys are deep into the budget cycle yeah. right now and I don't think there's anything in there that's uh, that's either particularly controversial or different than, than what you've done. A lot of a lot of the later feedback that we got on that was kind of tightening up that guidance to really focus on budget guidance. There were some other things in there that I'm not sure I would 
some of the, in the historical document that I'm not sure I would call budget guidance. You know, it kind of had some other other threads in there right. with it, and trying to kind of clean those up and stay focused on what the budget guidance should really be. So, okay. So, uh, Carl, you did a great job of summarizing the two or three remaining questions we had for emergency reserve funds. Uh, first question you had, I think, was in section two, and I've got. Do I have that? Did I remember to bring that with me? I apologize if I didn't. Budget guidance information, but I don't think I have the I brought one copy of the reserve fund day, reverse reserve fund comments. So uh, question in section two, uh, do we really want to strike the discussion of how the reserve targets were created? And I guess in retrospect, I think that's probably a good question. <laughs> yeah, we pro might be a good idea to keep that in there. Uh, what I don't know, and, and this may be just a discussion that we have to sort out going forward, is uh, as that document changes, and it'll change. You know, sure. that, that, was a, that was an initial set of, of, of targets. Those targets could well be revised in the future. So whether, I don't know if we carry those as part of a revision history against the document. I don't know if we carry them as part, as a revision history paragraph inside the document. I kind of not hard over one way or the other. Uh, I could see some attractiveness to having a re, some kind of revision history information inside the document because then you don't have to go find a second source to go figure out why, why things changed and when they changed. But I, I I think that's something that probably needs to, if we're going to keep it, we probably need to get it out of the middle of the policy statement and put some kind of revision history paragraph on it or something so we summarize it. I think that's fine. I mean, come up with something. Yeah. But we yeah, just got to keep it brief. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, but I think if we, yeah, maybe if we put a revision history, the bottom of the document or something we can identify. We can show the change history over time. We also probably have to explain what we're doing to it right now, which might not be a bad idea. Uh, the other one was section two, paragraph D. There was a question about whether the paragraph was necessary. And the way it was originally written was in 21, the Board of Review and established new minimum target levels. Uh, my suggestion was probably not not put that on the board, but put that on the general manager as I thought more about it. And I'll defer to Karina and, and Gary's thinking here. Uh, is that a general manager task or is that more of a controller task? Yeah. I don't have it in front of me, so could you restate what it says? <laughs> All it says right now, it says in 2021, the board will review and establish new minimum target funding levels for 22 and beyond. I think it probably needs to get tweaked just a little bit to say some role, whoever whoever draws the duty, will periodically review and establish new target funding levels. You know, but I don't know, I don't know if that's a board task, I don't know if that's a controller task, I don't know if that's a general manager task. And I'm I'm open to suggestions on who actually has the responsibility for doing that. Um. I did this quite late because I didn't get the email quite late. So about maybe an hour ago, I sent out my opinion on that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there are two issues. Number one is uh, not having directly to do with the, uh, what you said. Um, right now for 2022, we have no reserve goal other than, or we have no reserve increase goal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it would be good even if the, the answer was um, we recommend zero increase for next year, that would be appropriate. Right now we're putting together a budget and when we come to the, um, you know, what do we do with our operating cash? Uh, there's no goal for whether that be zero or a million dollars or anything. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it would be good for somebody and 
I don't know who that somebody is, to say in 2022, rather than uh, John and Karina having to pick a number without any guidance, mm -hmm. it would be better if we just had a goal, even if the goal is zero. If the board says, oh, we're good with zero, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's number one, which is not a process issue. Mm -hmm. The second one was um, thinking about whose job it is. Um, I kind of like Gary's statement. Oh, this isn't Gary's statement, he doesn't own this one. Uh, the board sets policy, the general manager <coughs> implements policy. Mm -hmm. If I'm the general manager, and I don't mean to take your job, and thank God I'm not the general manager, but my interest is to acquire as much funds as I need to operate the village and spend it. Um, it is essentially not in my interest to encourage savings because I need today as much money as possible simply to meet the demands of my job. Uh, it's the board's job to allocate resources. And within that, the general manager presumably participates in that process and supports that process and executes that process. Uh, so, uh, that, that, so my conclusion was, I really think it's the board's job to pick reserve targets. I couldn't um, agree with you more. Mm -hmm. I really think that's the way it needs to go. I agree with Tom there. I think I firmly believe board implement or develops policy, staff executes it. That's correct. Okay. Just an interjection, would there be any possibility to think differently than everybody else of having a minimum percentage of increase in reserve policy? They can always revise it each year, but would that be a bit of a stopgap safeguard situation? That's and something the, we haven't thought about, but yes. And the, <laughs> the way that the current policy was and building those funds, they had a five-year goal. Mm -hmm. And so while some years you were able to achieve it and other years you weren't, as long as you, we may, met our goal at the end of the five years. So I think as long as we are looking at long-term and not just a year-by-year -year basis and keeping that in mind. And that allows for some flexibility if we keep that same methodology. Okay, that's fine. And the only, and, and I have no argument with, with the arguments that you made. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I think the, I think the practicality of where we are near term, the next year or two, is we set, we set a goal to establish reserves. Fortunately, we were able to establish those reserves. We're now working on moving some of those reserves into more of an emergency reserve kind of a kind of a situation at the same time we now have two new funds mm -hmm. which are capital appreciation funds for utility non-utility activities i suspect that if i were sitting on the board channeling a little bit i would be much more concerned about how I'm going to establish the funding levels for those funds yes. since those are going to be the dollars that I'm going to reach out for first in the event that I have something come up that I have to go I have to go consume those dollars. So I, I kind of wrote down, I don't know whether this will pass muster or not, but essentially what I wrote down is the board will periodically review and establish new minimum target funding levels, period. You know, don't put a don't put a time window on them. Don't put a don't put a requirement on them. You know, I, I think to Karina's point, we might need to put this in the document that those funding levels have to be long-term goals. That probably not practical to set them on an annual basis. That probably needs to be a target to achieve some some rate of of, uh, of reserves over a three to five year window to give us the flexibility to be able to budget accordingly. I don't quite know how to write that in there right now, but I'll figure something out. Well, A, I think that's, if not good enough, it's pretty good. Uh, the second is far more practical, which is when you look at John and Karina and say, how badly do you guys want a goal for this year's budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think to his point, right now, 
we're, we need to be focusing on the, the two new accounts, and, and that's where our focus should be if we're going to set any goal. Um, mm -hmm. And then we can recoup with it. Or you know, come yeah. back on the other side. But that would be one of the goals associated with building capital funds. Ever, ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think I think the reality of it is that we're working on a reserve fund policy here. We probably need to have some kind of corresponding policy on yes. capital funds. Well, yeah. <laughs> and that's a, and yeah. very 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 similar yeah. to this one, but a different but a different beast with a different objective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. That's not on today's agenda, but. Yes. And um, Carl and I did discuss yeah. the necessity of us at some point in time. Yeah. Sooner the better. Yeah, and, it, and, it's, and it's probably a good idea. I guess I, I would recommend for now, because we've, our docket's pretty full the next few weeks, I'd recommend we perhaps take an action to ourselves roughly one October to come back with a draft or draft thoughts on a capital funds policy, yeah, because we've got uh, fee schedules in the in the near in the near term, and right behind that, we've got some of the budget information. So we're going to be pretty occupied the next four to five weeks, and I think that's higher priority stuff because we need to, we need to get through those and get them done, and then we can come back to the policy. So, any other comments in that section? No. The next section I had, and I think this was just a confusion thing. Uh, I thought the reserve, all the reserves were fully funded as of May for at least the reserve funds. I know 2022. The 2022. So, if 21 performs as expected, that's what is in on the budget. Um, so once we approve to actually fulfill those, they will be done. And so okay. was it May, May when they do it after the final audit. Okay, okay. But so it's with really, 21's funds. It's 21 funds, but it's not It's not going to be fully funded until the audit's right. concluded is really what it amounds to. What's fully okay. funded. Okay, that was my misunderstanding. That. Mm -hmm. That's your target. Right, so at the end of 21, if we perform as expected, then we'll be able to complete it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we probably need to probably need to make sure the words reflect that reality mm -hmm. in that section is all. And then section four. Go back to section three on okay. the on the sure. paragraph about the two thousand fourteen water expansion. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank Some you. suggestions just to strike it. At least in that first sentence. Yeah. That almost, that feels to me, thank you for bringing that up, that feels to me like kind of the topic we were just talking about that's sort of a revision history. You know, mm -hmm. the, the driver for a lot of the reserve fund policy being initiated and, and the targets being established was that 2014 event. Uh, I don't know that it's appropriate in the middle of the middle of the policy statement, but it it was something historical that happened, and we had to do things as a result of it. So it would be nice if we could find a way, whatever mechanism we use for revision history, that this thing probably makes its way over into revision history. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you for not letting me get away without addressing that. And then the last item uh, was under funding philosophy. Now that could change based on mm -hmm. section two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if I'm wondering if we establish it properly in section two if we need section four. So I guess where I'm at right now is I'm inclined to see what we come up with with a revision to section two and then see whether or not there's any applicability of that information or whether we're 
kind of saying the same thing a second time. Fair enough. Okay. And those were... Those were all I had. Yeah, those were your notes. I didn't have anything else other than those. Did anybody else see anything that we needed to touch base on? If not, I'll turn that back over to you, Carl, and hopefully we'll have this thing pretty well finalized here before too long. Then we can we can pass it through staff review and board review. So. Cool. That leaves us with the fee schedule review. So John, I, John, Karina, I'll let you guys tell us how you want to do this. <laughs> you got it. I emailed you guys the spreadsheet just a little while ago. I've also given you a hard copy. This is not the final version as it shows all of our edits so we can walk through. Um, we're going to go tab by tab and I will have the directors come up and go through it with you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Can you guys see that moving very well? We'll start with administration. So your assessments, the increase is only the 5.8% by the Southern CPI for June. Uh, the only thing that is being proposed as far as changes on the other fees is the transfer fee for assignment, so you can assign your uh, rights over to others. Historically, that has been 25. Uh, going back to 2015, it is, it is it was 25 all the way back then. Mm -hmm. So the suggestion is to f increase it to 40. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry, I went a little far. Um, based upon 2020's end of year, that would be about a $9,500 increase. Mm -hmm. The other recommendation is the transfer fee for dated owner changes, which is pretty much a processing fee mm -hmm. for staff to, to do everything. Um, with the system that historically has been $125 as well and so the proposal is 150 that also dated back to 2015 and that increase would bring roughly $37,000 additional 2020 had about 185,000 okay a new fee for notary services the POA does provide those for non-POA documents and stuff, and we have not had a fee established. So that is just setting that in place at $7 so that we can continue to provide those services. It's a nice convenience for the village. I honestly didn't know you had that service. So well, that's good to know. We, we don't, but some people have found it, and, and they're starting to use it a lot more, so we really need to charge people. Well, I mean, it's not unreasonable. You're taking a, a staffer's time to go provide that service. And, and $7 and is in line with what they charge other places. Mm -hmm. And, somebody and you're supposed to charge account. a fee for your notary services. Yep. Absolutely. So. There's been no change to our regular gate cards and vehicle decals. Uh, one change we did make with work passes, you can see previously we had been $15 for the work pass decal. Last year it had increased to $30. And along with the work pass, um, the actual card itself had gone from 35 in 2019 to 60 last year. So we're recommending to leave that the same. However, we know we do have a lot of the smaller businesses that has a lot of turnover staff, such as our restaurants and stuff like that. So to try to be a little more understanding and accommodating, what we're proposing is to keep the same fee as last year, but up to five. And so anything after five would be just an additional $10 to try to help reduce some of that extra cost that those but in, order, but, it, but in order to uh, get that fee, they have to bring back the gate card and the sticker yes. to That's us. Yes, just when, what I was going to ask is what happens if yes. there is turnover. So that we're sure we get it back. Mm -hmm. And so that's Good pretty much what we're saying. For the first five, if you're bringing it back and you're replacing it with something else, that would still count as your five. Yeah. But an, an additional would go above. Okay. I, I actually think that's a really good idea, and I think that's a way to lean forward to some of the some of the businesses here in the village because staff turnover is a real issue for everybody. Some of them stay a week. 
Pardon me? So they hire them and they stay a week, and then they're at $90 for a Yeah, that's, so. that's pretty painful. Yeah. Well, and one thing to note on the work pass, all of that revenue that is generated goes to the streets department. Okay. It's for street maintenance. So while we have a lot of the heavier trucks that come in and stuff, it is our smaller businesses that usually have a lot more vehicles. So trying to wait for both options. And, and, and disclosure here that there was a proposal to add a higher fee for the heavier trucks, mm -hmm. but there's really no way for us to monitor that. And, and mm -hmm. that the reason we're not going that direction right now. Yeah, we, we recognize that that's one of those, it seems like a really good idea, and this is a frat up recommendation. We recognize it's a really good idea, but it's really tough to administer. You're right. It is a good idea, but we, we just can't. Yeah, we were concerned about the unintended consequences of that, too, because it might cause some of the suppliers to be reluctant to deliver here in the village, and that would not be good for our growth. And, and that happens a lot. So that is all we have on the admin side. I have comments. Yes. Um, I'm going to take out my little rubber mallet and start pounding away at POA membership privileges. First, uh, given the recommendations of the FRAT F, uh, seeing the $500, um, I would support personally any increase of $30 or more because I think in year one, they're proposing $250 per month. Is that correct? Something like that? I'm sorry, one more time. For non-resident lot owners, for empty lots, uh, the recommendation for the assessment increase is $250 a month. $2.50. Something like that, which is $30 bucks a year. The board, the board hasn't actually voted on an option, but it's in that, it's in that general it, area, yes. The, the recommendation mm -hmm. and the, how we set fees don't need to be linked, but generally the $500 is expected to cover at a minimum, the, uh, nor the the assessment. Correct. So why you would keep it at 500 between the 5.8% and all this other stuff, I personally would, and just looking into the crystal ball, would not oppose and I would support increasing the $500. That's just me. Um, <clears throat> Tom, we can, let me just to sure. respond. We can certainly do that, and I don't have a problem with it. We're talking maybe 10 or 15. It, well, it, it's very, very. That's helpful. the point. Strategically, years ago, it was recommended that we, that we get rid of that category entirely. As far as I know, we do not actively sell memberships. We have heard that we should be selling membership lots. So right now, we're kind of in this phase where we're just looking at it with no strategic direction for this category. It would be reasonable, and this isn't for staff, it's probably staff and board to decide, maybe, or you just recommend. You either get rid of that category entirely, you actively market it, or you establish a lot membership sales program. And that is part of the lot strategy that we're okay. debating now that we're, that we're coming, that's a piece of it that is not quite ready to bring to you. But okay. when we bring it to you, it'll come through this committee mm -hmm. first. But I see what you're saying because even at the 2022 proposed unimproved, it's 42.29, it's $7.48 more than just buying privileges. And there should be, I right. think, much more of a differential. That's And there are definitely two, two sides in this argument about competing with property owners and and uh, and us getting selling memberships and you're right we don't actively solicit them now but if somebody calls and wants one we do have that available yeah. it's it's minimal but that will be in the lot strategy right. when we bring okay. it to you i'm good with that i will put away my little rubber mallet <laughs> no keep it out okay i'm be interested to see what that turns into john but I'm, me too anything else john? nope Oh yeah, I did have one. Uh, do we, I thought at one time we actually registered businesses. Uh, there that is was the lawsuit. Oh, there is a fee? Yes. Not business on that, listing? Not on that one. Yeah, business it's listing. in another. So oh, that's uh, business listing and registering business. I thought were two different things. No, there's, there's another line somewhere. Oh. Yeah, I want to say there's something under um, P&I. 
yeah. I believe. It's not much. It's, it's like not twenty five dollars, and that's fine. But it's, so it's not on this page, but someplace. I think it's over in P and I, but we'll oh, make okay. sure. This is another strategic issue. It's on P and I, Stephanie. Yeah, there's a there's a fee for permitting of that in home business. Oh, okay. Not, not yeah. businesses that are not in the home. Though. Right. Oh. Yeah, it's like if you're Thank having you. a daycare out of your home or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so so uh, this is off topic. It's a strategic issue. Um, should we register rentals? Not a fee issue. It's opportune for me to bring it up. No, and Stephanie, you ought to talk about that. <laughs> These are good, good questions. Um, so I'm going to have to admit, having slept since I looked at this list of fees the last time, what are we calling business listing? 35? What is? What are you calling that? I what think that's for advertising. That's there, so I, I, I don't know what you guys are doing. That's what? I'll have to go back and double check on, on that one. I don't want to put it to you. Uh, I think it's an advertising. I, I was going to say, I think be. it's with... The fee that we charge to put them on our website. That's what I was thinking, but I want to confirm that. Uh, okay. That makes sense. Okay, then I, I'll vote with you, Tom. I'm not submitting anything. To <laughs> I'm just coming up with wacko ideas. No, it's good. We're not presenting a fee for rental listings at this point, but we are looking at potentially some sort of a, um, a policy or a procedure or rule that we can get board approved that would mirror or at least somewhat follow the recent work that the city of hot springs has done in an ordinance they've they've passed an ordinance to deal with short-term rentals and some of the challenges that they're facing which are many of the same that we are such as noise and traffic and parking concerns and all that kind of stuff so while we're not bringing a recommendation to you at this moment i think you'll see something yeah. probably in the next six months or so yeah. my comment was less towards fees and more towards information and data I would like to see us register rentals, and if we charge a fee, then so be it. But well, to me, the information and data is, is invaluable. What we, do, what we do track, though, Tom, is when um, uh, somebody comes in to get a vehicle sticker or a pass, they register as a renter. Mm -hmm. they, okay. So we know, that we, have, we know that we have X number of renters in the village that have gate cards or you know, decals on their, on their vehicles or passes to get in the gate. So we do have some data on renters, just not okay. by the Great. home. So I think and is your Tom, Tom, is your comment directed towards long-term rentals or short-term rentals? Both. Both, okay. And we can track both by the cards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I think in the interest of recognizing we're on tab one of about 15 tabs, yep. uh, absolutely agree that there's an opportunity out there associated with rentals particularly interval ownership rentals but it is not settled legal matters at this point in time so it's going to require a good bit of legwork on the part of the staff to figure out what the right approach is that we can that we can manage and control and implement and also stay within the, the current guidelines. You know, we're, we're in a little bit of a unique place here because not being a municipal entity, there are certain things we can't do, uh, though there are probably venues at our disposal, but that whole problem needs to be studied before it can be brought in here. One of the things that's bringing this to light or to the attention of more people is especially the daily or the two or three day. When the person leaves, he piles his trash out at the street. We've got once a week pickup. So that's being brought to our attention pretty heavily. So uh, whatever the solution is, it needs to be addressed. The subject needs to be addressed. Oh, I agree, Gary. Okay. Anything else in administration before we go to the next one? Next up. Tom, I'll let you come up here and drive. Drive. Okay, 
the fees for 2022, we basically have four categories that were increased. I'm going to start with the green fee annuals. The turn it around. The green fee annuals that have not been um, increased since 2016. Wow. Our proposal is a hundred dollar increase for the single annual green fee and a hundred and fifty dollar increase for the uh, couple's annual green fee. And being an annual member, as much as it pains me to say this, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> the second part of that is the uh, annual cart fees. We did the same percentage. We're going to increase uh, the annual cart fee, the, the trail fee, from $550 up $25 to $575. Same with the individual cart lease. And then all uh, couples go up $50 as opposed to uh, the $25. Do you have a feel, Tom, for what that's going to do for you? Yeah, I've got the totals here about. We're talking the, the increase in the annual green fees is uh, about a sixty-one thousand dollars increase. The private cart increase comes to about fourteen and a half, fourteen thousand five hundred. The third part of that is the daily carts. To increase the daily cart for twelve dollars to thirteen dollars, a one dollar increase for members and for guests. So the members will go from twelve to thirteen dollars, and the guests from fifteen to sixteen dollars. Mm -hmm. That, and also on the daily private cart, when you register your cart, you pay a daily. That's going to go from seven dollars to seven fifty. Okay. Those combined come out to one hundred thirty-eight thousand eight hundred, roughly, and that's pretty conservative too. Mm -hmm. And the fourth change we've been going back and forth. And I'll go back back to the top is to create Cortez as part of the Isabella and, and Granada green fee schedule, meaning a, a prime course. Mm -hmm. So basically it would cost the, the member a $1 increase in their green fee and a guest at about a $10 increase. Mm -hmm. So what it is is bringing up the price of Cortez to equal Granada and Isabella, which is our top tier. Mm -hmm. And those are the four changes, and I come out with roughly $262,000 of increased revenue. I uh, got a couple questions. Is can you open? Sure. <laughs> um, what consideration did you give to increasing the church surcharge? I, I didn't catch that, Tom. I'm sorry. Uh, what did consideration did charge? you give to increasing the two dollar and fifty cent surcharge to something higher? Was that was that considered at all? Or? It was not. Okay. Um, there was some talk last year about thinking about the nine hole, uh, the surcharge for nine hole, whether that's a way of stimulating more nine hole rounds. Any thoughts about the nine hole surcharge? It's about a $40,000, $42,000 hit. Um, mm -hmm. We have about 35,000 nine hole rounds. Um, okay. Our nine hole rounds are increasing every year, not decreasing. Okay, so. I know that most of you haven't been around that long, but the surcharge is nothing new. We had it back to 2000. Up to 2000. Yeah, Granada. since 2000. Yeah. And it was $3 at one point, and they lowered it to $2 because the reasoning was to let future people pay more than the people that were here now. But it's always been the same as nine holes and 18 holes. Mm -hmm. Not that that is any indication of anything. I just wanted to give some history. Okay. I'm just and right now we're counting total rounds as total rounds. The nine hole and 18 are equal as one round. So. I think you should charge the surcharge to say a round is a round. So. Okay. Very good. I uh, have to ask, the what used to be the $1,000 prepaid card is now 1100 Just generally, what what's your um, evaluation of that program? Well, we originally started out, obviously, we budgeted very low of about 50 of them uh, the first year, and we, and we did 560 of them. Mm -hmm. And we're, st we're on pace this year to do the same amount. I think it gives our property owner, we got, we, you were part of this fees committee back when we got rid of the six month uh, <laughs> annual, and this kind of gives the opportunity of the person that doesn't have the 2100 up front, they get to do about half of that, 
but the, the best deal still in town is your annual. You're going to get more on more bang for your buck out of your annual. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a good. I, I think it continues to work well. I think the uh, OA gets the money up front. They spend it as they go. Uh, it is a dis discount. Um, mm -hmm. But like we said, at the end of the year, that money, they'd spend it or lose it. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Well, and it looks like you, you're bumping that a conservative amount. It looks like you're bumping it from 1100 to 1125 for sure. Uh, we were, and I... I that's that what's in. on there. Yeah, 11 to 1125 Okay. We find that that's more of a convenience fee, that people just don't want to bring money in. Yeah, that yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know a lot of people come November and December when you want, want as much play as you can get are saying... I got to play or lose it. So you're exactly right. It does right. have a big we've learned, increase. We've learned that they start. Uh, uh oh, I've got to play some more. I mean, Maybe. we've had people buy three in a year, mm -hmm. and that's a lot more than an annual. So <laughs> yeah. I just had a question about the green fee individual annual and the ACH from years past. Mm -hmm. It it the total is less than a hundred dollars from twenty five eighteen to twenty six ten. Are we absorbing part of the ACH billing or? Am I missing something? That's who you said you were doing the ACH. Because oh, I never I, knew I how they did the ACH. I have not updated the ACH. So okay. if you take his base fee and add that 15%. Fantastic. I just knew it was a big amount. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I just plugged those numbers in. I knew accounting would do the ACH part of it. Okay. Cool. Um, this, this is not a golf specific question, just the ACH in general that's present in a lot of different fees. Mm -hmm. uh, how well is that working? Or just what's your evaluation of the whole ACH? Um, offering? Well, I know it was a big thing in question last time um, as far as the, um, the percentage and how it's done. And we did review it. And the way my understanding is some people were viewing it as uh, an upcharge, but really it was being presented as if you pay up front, that's a discount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. There, there is time and processing each month that goes into doing the ACH and, and tracking all of that and the fees from the bank associated with it. So for now, we are leaving it at that amount. Is it being used a lot or a little? Or? Um, well, we offer it with golf, fitness, and tennis. Obviously, golf is going to be your bigger one. Um, there are people that do utilize it, yes, mm -hmm. because then it allows them to make that payment over the year. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Can I just ask, and, and the uh, annuals are continued to be totally non-refundable? Are you getting a lot of requests for refunds from We do. We do get a lot of requests, and a lot of them are cannot play golf anymore. Yeah. Um, it was, um, it's a hard decision to make every time about the refund because a lot of guys uh, cannot play anymore, and, yeah. and I don't think it's right not to give their money back, so we have refunded some annuals. Okay. I just we try to be we try to be fair and, and ethical as we can. But it, they can't do it. I think I read somewhere they can't do it repetitively. No, like because they can't buy another annual. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a one-time only thing. Yeah. Okay. Not necessarily for this conversation, but it'd be good to know at some point kind of where where we are with trending on people taking the various packages. You know, the annuals and the couples and all of that. Kind of where are we? Yeah. Meaning how many? Yeah. Um, when I did the numbers to get you the, about a 260000 increase, I just mirrored last year's. Um, they've been re... How do I say this? Reassigned in parts into... They've lumped them in different categories. Uh, but it's, it's been pretty constant over the last two years, about 445 annual. The one thing that has been a little bit... Uh, on the downward slide has been the individual cart leases because I believe more people are buying private carts. So the private carts are going up. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a uh, newbie question. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a golfer anymore. So um, on the just the daily green fees, mm -hmm. it, for the most part, they haven't changed since 2019. No. What's the, they haven't changed since... I think 18. I was just curious as to why that's not considered. Well, what we do is we have flex pricing, um, and they change during the season. Each, they change when the weather gets bad again, and they'll go lower, and then when the weather gets nice, they go higher. Um, that was a big change this year for Cortez. It's going to jump up and be higher. It's about a dollar higher than it has been in the past. Um, I think we're at a point 
with the surcharge added on at the same time, we've already increased, you know, you're increasing that total number already by $2.50. Now we're adding another dollar for the cart. Then if we had another dollar or more for the green fees, now you're looking at a substantial increase, and I think that might drive people away from planning. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. 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 Thank maybe, you. maybe a little too far, a little too fast. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the sticker shock effect or whatever. And, and also this... That number you see there is the maximum, which the board voted on years ago. We haven't even come close to that maximum yet, so um, that's why there's no change in that. We have not even got to that level. Yet. Okay. Okay, uh, I have a comment regarding the format of the, um, the fees, not the fees themselves. We have lots and lots and lots of golf fees <laughs> that aren't listed here at all. Um, the, the big dollar ones are probably uh, accompanied member guest and just outside guest. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a formula in your head, I assume, that links what you're charging on a day-to-day -day basis for the members to the other you know, bunch of fees. Our rack rate would be our highest rate. Right. Yeah. And we're at anywhere between uh, $59 to $79 right now. Right, right. Um, <laughs> We're in what we call a sweet spot right now. I'll give you an example. Um, our stay and play packages are, sub, in fact, I just looked just now, and they're at $663,000, and we were at four hundred thirty-three last year. So we're up over $200,000, and I, and I want to keep that price level kind of consistent a little bit. We are bumping in a little with the cart, but it's more of a marketing thing. When you get to 79, it sounds a lot better than 82 or whatever, so we're trying to stay in that area. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, well, the point is, you know, we're pretty detailed on a lot of our fees. There, we're just totally silent. They're on that website every month. Right, but uh, this is what the uh, board approves. And I don't know what is necessary or totally unnecessary to list that or state that we have bunches of fees out here. We don't have specific dollar amounts, but just really broad guidance. I, I think, I think John, John can correct me if I'm wrong. It, the member fee is the one that's always been having to approve by the board for the fees and not the guest fees. Could you could change them as needed? Is, am I correct? That was that? after I left. No, okay. when I was here, yeah. they had to approve everything. Yeah, no, we, we were told just the member fee by the past boards. Um, okay. And we try to, if, if our demand is up with the guest, we do go up on the guest fees. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. okay. We're trying to, we're trying to keep the member fees down and, and and collect more revenue from the guests. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. okay. But the package play is working. I mean, it is okay. really working well. Last year was a good year, and this year's just destroying it. Mm -hmm. And for this year's budget, being conservative, I think I budgeted four hundred thousand dollars on packages, and where it's there's there's a chance we hit seven hundred thousand this year. But mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, I, I think so. I think that's uh, a great addition, and it's really helping the revenue out quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But in terms of policy, what I'm hearing is policy is we approve member rates. We don't necessarily have the same standard for not member rates. What we do is take the rack rate, and then for we, we take the same discount for the company member guest at every course, and then discount a little more for the family. But so we're, we're discounting off the rack rate. So maybe the rack rate would be the best thing that we could publish. Well, but you, you are at liberty to set the, the rack rate. I mean, I think the other principle is and this is a principle, member rates typically are the lowest rates. No, Maybe they are the lowest rates. Not typically. They always will be. Well, the is that's yeah. even true for junior? Yeah. Even well, juniors, the juniors, you have to be a member of the juniors. And that's, that's okay. the, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a way to stimulate mm -hmm. future golfers okay. <laughs> instead of losing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's not enough to hurt our, our revenue. It, it only enhances, hopefully, more property owners down the road. Do they still have to play with a member? In order to get that right? No, they just have to play in the afternoon. After two. After two. Okay. I'm just really um, getting at is we have a fee schedule. What should or needs to be in the fee schedule? What doesn't need to be in the schedule? To make it simple when you look at it. I get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yep. Oh, did you already go over your court tab? I guess you did. 
Yeah, I think he did. He did. Yeah. I think he did. Yeah, he did. He did. So Terry and Stephanie with all of your fitness. And Terry has revised a different spreadsheet. I think this one, ours includes most of it, but there may be one or two, so I'm going to open up his real quick. Thank you. <laughs> Right. I'm glad this one's on the screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a little different. I apologize. I was having some difficulty with my teams acting right. So uh, basically what we got with our tennis and outdoor uh, programming is a lot of uh, our fees on our amenities are staying pretty close to the same as what they are. There's a few things, for example, like on line 20 pickleball only got raised a dollar for the annual. Uh, where we really did our uh, making up revenue in this area is right here with our uh, with our bundle. Mm -hmm. uh, this year we sold 85 total of the uh, recreation amenity bundle for singles, mm -hmm. and for the couples we sold 72. Mm -hmm. uh, that went from 550, which was uh, the fitness center and the tennis center were both 450 dollars for the annual membership, mm -hmm. and that bundle was 550. That kind of covered everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, we think that was a little bit low, uh, so we raised that regular bundle price up to $650, and then we added in also a second bundle option that has two, uh, two days of golf a week at Coronado Golf Course. I think it's Tuesdays and Thursdays. You can, you can make a reservation and play there for $750. So as far as when we made up money in this area, it's, another, it's a $39,224 increase. If we have the exact same kind of sales that we had this last calendar year from August of last year to August of this year, we'll increase that revenue by, again, $39,224. The other option that we have is uh, we raise the daily rate for, we made the fitness center, uh, tennis, and pickleball daily rate all the same at $8, and we're given the option of buying I'm going to write the amenity pass. It's a five day or a 10 day or a five visit or 10 visit where if you get it, you just get it at a discount. So instead of going there, we're just trying to encourage bulk selling. Maybe we'll get more people buy it if we do it in that package. Mm -hmm. um, on the ACA, <coughs> how it relates to us in Parks and Recreation, we don't have a lot of ACH sales. Uh, we had uh, four to ACH buying the bundle and two bought it in tennis. And this is on down the line, but the, the fitness center had 18 people. So as far as ACHs go, that's all that we have in, in our department. Okay. So question for you folks, is it worth, for that, for that comparatively small number of people, is it worth maintaining those lines in your pricing structure? I, that's what we, we want to take all those lines out. We'd rather just have one line on top that says ACH is a 15% charge or, or that way. Yeah. Uh, I want to take out all the super senior prices and just have one line that says all super seniors and parks and recreation are 50% off. Because right now it's, it's kind of overwhelming looking at our, <laughs> looking at our, at our fee sheet. And that should condense it quite a bit just by putting those two line statements yeah. on. Yeah, I like I like where you're going with that because the simpler the simpler the fee structure, the easier it'll be for people to understand and it doesn't sound like you're taking you are not taking away something that's in, in strong demand and for the super seniors you're still giving them the discount they've become accustomed to, they just get to it a slightly different way. Awesome, awesome. Okay. The only thing I think that, that uh, we're saying I think our pickleball price may be a little bit low, but after just what we dealt with over the last year and a half over there, mm -hmm. I think we're just we're best to keep it at that just you know 190 instead of 189. Yeah. It's not a real increase. So. Uh, and you're right until until the pickleball court situation gets squared away. This probably isn't a good time to go asking for more money right there. There you go. There you go. Can we, can we just for one second? So one of the things that we've considered and, and we're still sort of toying with this is throwing bocce, lawn bowling, archery, croquet. Um, when you when you add all of those revenue generators up together for the year annually, it's 10,000 or less dollars that we generate. Mm -hmm. So uh, especially if we have a successful campaign in our assessment approach, then we would, we would ask that you consider making those free amenities. Mm -hmm. So we're, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that's one of the things 
with the, if you get a positive assessment vote, that might be a nice head nod to the community, the folks that use those those facilities. I Still some things to work out, but we're, right. it's something right. that we've at least been, been looking at. And it's still a bargain price at the six fifty for the bundle anyway, with just tennis, fitness, and pickleball, and do the golf for seven fifty. So it's still, it's still sell. Can you scroll back just a fraction? I thought I saw the dog park there real quick, and I had a yeah. had a tickler for self there. I did raise the we did raise the dog park a little significant. Well, I don't know if it's significant from thirty dollars to thirty seven fifty. Really, we just have a lot of theft out there with with the. Poop bags and stuff. <laughs> I mean, people grab one and take a take a box home. So we just wanted to raise that price <laughs> and to try to cover our costs on that. Yeah, I can see that happening. How okay. much would it be to install cameras? Just <laughs> yeah, 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 it's I'm not, kidding. Probably no, not. It costs kidding. you more than just buying. <laughs> don't you have a camera now? Well, that's at good. The that's a dog park. I don't think good so. Good number of people used to dog park. That's great. Thank you. Some of the other stuff was just rounding. Yeah, and other other stuff is rounding from. Uh, we had a lot of funky price points, like eight dollars and three cents. So we just made an eight fifty or something like that, just kind of make those round up. Round, round it, round it in some direction. Yeah. There you go. Tom, uh, you observation. Yeah, I had one kind of goofy question. I might have missed something, but in the package, the whatever you call it, I can't barely read it. Uh, but anyway, in the package, the five fifty, six fifty thing. Um, Mini golf is not in there. No. No, in mini golf you have to go and rent the clubs. You can play, mini golf is free if you just have your own club and ball. The only reason we just charge is just a rental fee. Oh, I it. didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can go anytime you want. Mm -hmm. We're open from that clubhouse is open from nine to three, or well, you can I, go rent the materials. Yeah, I have my the club. clubs in my. Truck. Okay, there you go. And you're golden. <laughs> Just a question, you're giving a, a basically a refund or a not counting their annual pickleball now because it's going to be closed for six or eight weeks? I'm sorry, one more time? Isn't, is it uh, for the pickleball repairs? Yes, ma'am. For those who are annual presently, yes. aren't you kind of giving them a credit of six or eight weeks? We are. However long we're, however long that we stay closed, yes. we'll go back and take those however many folks we have. And that wouldn't substantially change that 39,000 number? It's no. just, yeah. just it's 140 people that would be extended okay. however many weeks that we have to do that. Okay. That would be a it's insignificant. Easy. Thanks. Sorry. It'd, it'd take a little bit off the top, but it's not a huge number. Yeah. And then again, I'll just, just as a refresher, all our many fields, fees are rolling, so you can buy at any point of the year. And it, is that working well? It's fairly popular? Or? It is. It's, okay. it's still been a weird year. I mean, it's, it's hard to... I mean, we just started picking everything back up with, with the COVID, and now we're just kind of hitting kind of a down spell with the COVID again. So it's really kind of hard. We were trending up uh, for about three months, and I'm uh, afraid to look at the report this month. But <laughs> uh, I think it's still going in the right direction. But, yeah, everybody likes the annuals, the, the rolling fees. Um, I have a geeky question for Karina. <laughs> so we collect 550 or 650 or whatever, and every month you have to allocate that to, how's that working? For the bundle or? Yeah, for the bundle. So the bundle is, I've, I've set up an allocation account in our accounting software that's based upon the percentages that go to each category. Mm -hmm. And so every time the passes are sold, it is dispersed uh, based upon that calculation. That says okay, so actual usage doesn't, I mean, it doesn't change every month. No. By, it's, it's a set allocation point. So if you sold okay. 10, 10 get allocated. If you sold 5 the next month, the 5 are allocated. I know, but, but you have to allocate it down to tennis and then pickleball. How, how does tennis get its grubby hands on? It's not allocated monthly, Tom. It's allocated one time at the time of sale. Okay. All right. Yeah, so per, you have 100% mm -hmm. makes up the right. 550. So then each one right. is getting a percentage. And that's what is set up in the system. So as right. soon as that's sold, I let the computer do the work. So yes, but the, I guess the question is, how do you determine how much tennis gets versus the fitness center? We we've given her that allocation based on 
each facility and how what their kind of what their annual fee is and what in fact we early on in the year because again this was our first year to, to attempt this we had the allocations off real yeah, frankly we didn't we didn't we were we were not right in our assumption okay. <laughs> we were allocating way too much to some and not near enough to others and yeah. so we that was the we question had, we adjusted <laughs> yeah, those allocations the usage and okay. fitness and tennis get the majority of it yeah yeah but with the new package maybe golf will get it they get a bit. chunk of it. But I mean, first off, it just has to be a guess, I guess. That's right. And then after, over time, you will have more information. That's right. To uh, kind of tweak. To tweak. Okay. I'm good. I've got a question along that line, but a different place. Uh, how much human interaction is required to keep all of the ACH payments in the period and, and the dates of when people memberships expire you know how, what's that costing you from a human standpoint to keep track of all of that well it depends on what it is but it's a few hours each month for each one because like i said we run the ach report so you're going through and verifying if they're still on and and all that more time gets spent as rates kind of roll over because doing the rolling stuff makes that more complicated and you're looking at each one on a one-on-one -on -one basis and setting up different price tiers um, and then as far as like your golf annuals and all of that, that is all touched through uh, an allocation being amortized out over the 12 months. So a few hours each month. Yeah, but the golf allocations based on the calendar year where, where these others are, somebody can call up and get a membership for the fitness center anytime they want. Yeah. Or the reason I'm asking is if it becomes sufficiently onerous. The good news is these packages have been very popular. That's great. The bad part is it puts overhead back on, on the staff. At, at some point in time, maybe we want to consider exploring an IT upgrade to get some of that touch labor out of the process if, if there is such an application out there. We're ahead of you. <laughs> okay. You could probably work. Yeah, it's it, and it's it's quite a massive undertaking. I mean, it's not just that; it's everything, mm -hmm. because we feel like that uh, we're going to have to uh, at some point, just for service and availability and, and being able to do things so much easier than we do now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll go into that with you later, but but we're down the road. I'll just I'll just look forward to when you guys have that proposal put together, and we'll take a look at it when you're ready. You know, we'll let you all work. I will say going to the rolling has been, you know, more of a challenging thing on both the accounting side of it and then also the maintenance of each record, you know, making sure the pricing is correct and so forth. Um, but we did it, so we're eating it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it seems like the right thing to do, but in retrospect, it sounds like maybe a little, a little more automated assistance there could be on and, and it's out there, but we just don't have the availability to tap into it with our current system. Sure, sure. So, yeah, well, once, once you get that, that that option fully flushed out, it'll be interesting <coughs> to see what it looks like. We've got a, uh, uh, a guided tour going with us because we've got another sister community putting one in. So we've got a, uh, a, road, a roadway Cool. Uh, that we don't have to discover for ourselves. Excellent. There's a lot to be said for that. Let Absolutely. Them, let them take all the arrows. You can learn lessons. Okay. Especially if you've been through a couple of them. Yeah. IT conversions suck. Yeah. I don't have anything else unless anybody else does. You want to go to the facility rentals? Yes, let's do it. Okay. All right, so these are the first two tabs. We're picking money up again. This one is about $40,000. And a facility rentals is... Uh, we're projecting uh, to pick up an extra $25,000, right around $25,000. Uh, again, most of our facilities, we're not raising the price outside of, you know, if it's something $66.03, we just made it $66.50. Mm -hmm. We really think we are kind of capped out at about how much our room's value is to rent them. Mm -hmm. uh, we did take up, uh, uh, just by listening to our members, we took out a, a few of the fees that, that, uh, 
I, I guess the best way to say it is a lot of people don't like saying we're nickel and diming to death. Mm -hmm. uh, the setup and cleaning fees. Uh, long story short, if you're renting one of our, our facilities during operating hours, we're not going to charge you for it. Uh, but we increased it if you're renting on a Saturday or a Sunday or after 4 o'clock where we're, waiting, where we're having to have additional staff in that we wouldn't normally have to have. Outside of that, we kind of took that fee out. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed you have a lot of zeros on some of these. Is that for 21? Is that, do you think that's a COVID-related thing, or is that? A lot of it is. And most of those zeros, honestly, are uh, the two rates. There's rate structure we have where if you're a... a doing something for a business to make profit mm -hmm. or a non-member, those are the ones that with COVID we've seen just basically zero. Sure. People aren't coming in here to, where typically we'd have three or four shows a year by a, a promoter at the Woodlands. We're not, we're not seeing that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, where we're really going to pick up money, uh, revenue in this group is basically for our concerts at the Woodlands mm -hmm. uh, on a couple of different, uh, a couple of different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, most importantly, I guess we'll start with uh, traditionally we've spent about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year on our ticket selling software system, mm -hmm. where it's a service that we provide, we pay for, and an organization like the Concert Association, we don't recoup any of that money. Mm -hmm. So we've uh, we just pay for it. It it runs about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month, depending on how many tickets that we sell. Mm -hmm. uh, what we have in here right now. Is for a couple reasons. Number one, instead of just eating all that money, uh, we'll still provide the service and do all the work, but uh, our cost increased with that uh, software company, so we're putting in a uh, dollar uh, per ticket charge to the organization. So if the concert association has a concert, they sell 654 tickets, they'll have an extra $654 charge to their ending bill. So. It's something that we'll end up having to pay because our price is raised to 79 cents a ticket. But uh, doing it this way, instead of just spending 15 or 20, mm -hmm. we'll make 4,000. So that, that right there in itself is a $20,000 turnaround that we can do. Uh, this other thing, I just wanted to put on there, it's kind of insignificant, but donations on ticket sales, mm -hmm. uh, we, we added that fee because that just got added to us this year with our ticket selling system. I wanted to make sure it was on here because I'm sure if, if we don't have it on here, some organizations will let me know when I try to charge that 5% fee. So I wanted to make sure that shows. Uh, one of the things that we're going to have in here that's a little bit different is uh, we aren't going to make as much money on the card club. They have a, you know, traditionally we've had a contract with them that's $3,250 a month. We haven't had that for over a year now. Uh, they are back in the building and uh, I think they're paying us between $750 and $1,000 a month, depending on attendance. Mm -hmm. I see that staying like that for a while, especially with, with this new variant that's going around. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing we did add, we end up having to add a fee. So to rent, anybody else can rent that room, and now it's an added fee of $41 an hour. Uh, I think that'll be successful. We have groups doing that right now. But it's a, it's a new fee because we never rented it out because the card club had the contract. So, dumb guy question because I don't know how this works. Uh, when shows are put on at the Woodlands, uh, how does the POA acquire whatever I'll use the phrase their cut of that of that event is? Is that a, is that a fee per ticket? Is that some kind of a charge for the hall? There, there's there's a bunch of different ways. Now, the POA we run our own shows like we run a summer concert series. Thursday night, the Beach Boys will be in town. I, I got tickets. I have tickets. <laughs> uh, we make all the money on that outside of paying the contract with the agents and the bands. Okay. When we have an organization come in, they rent the facility. There's like uh, several different layers of uh, levels of charges. Uh, if it's like a big six or seven piece band, it's one thousand one hundred fifty dollars. If it's like a three piece band, it's eight hundred fifty. And if it's just a presenter, someone giving a speech or a presentation it's 750 and I actually there's there's one more fee that I forgot to put on here that I'm adding it's going to be called a backline fee uh, what happens there again another organization will have a concert in it's a, it's a band touring in from California 
all of them don't bring their own drums from wherever they're at. Mm -hmm. So we have to provide the back line, which means our, our tech staff goes out there, they track it down, they, they research it, they find it, they pick it up, they put it together. Um, we've been doing that as a free service mm -hmm. all along. Now we're going to charge, start charging, we're wanting to charge $175 each time that we have to do that. Because um, I, I, Paul's, I've seen him spend three weeks trying to track down a certain kind of guitar for a band. Okay. So that's the service that um, that we're going to add also and get charged. So um, it was a good way to be able to increase revenue in this tab item without really making these rooms unrentable. Sure, sure, sure. So again, dumb guy question because I wasn't here until 20. Uh, clearly, Things have been kind of on a hiatus because of all the COVID and all that. We've been coming back to life this year. About how many shows a year do we actually put on at the Woodlands? In a typical year, it'd probably be around 35 to 40 shows. And that'd be a combination of the Coronado Center and the Woodlands. The Woodlands is always a safe bet for 30, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, us as a POA are, are going to do six, and the concert associations are going to do 12. That's 18 right there. Then you throw in like the Symphony Guild, the, the Community Foundation, the Qantas concert bands. It's easily between 30 and 40. Mm -hmm. And is that kind of indicative of what our history had been prior to prior to COVID, or are we still trying to come back up to it? Uh, we're definitely trying to come back. We've had we've actually had to cancel two shows upcoming in the next couple months. Mm -hmm. Last week, mm -hmm. so we again we started that uptrend, and now it's, we'll see what happens. It sure, it sure seems like a, it's a wonderful facility. It is. You know, and it, it sure seems like uh, there's an opportunity for us to be able to take advantage of having a, a rare facility in, inside of our gates. Yeah. Clearly, we've got to get past all of COVID and all of the other effects associated with that before we can really get back, get back to where we'd like to be. But it sure would be nice to see that number go to a... You know, 70 or 80 shows a year. I It'd mean, be awesome. It's certainly profitable for the POA and, <laughs> and good opportunities for people to, to see programs. The biggest challenge we have is it's, it's pretty easy to see that we have a pretty steady base of three to 4,000 people that buy tickets. Mm -hmm. We have a hard time selling tickets outside the gates. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really, if you go to the shows, you see the same three or 4,000 people's faces all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, the POA does a show, we, we actually we make a lot of money. We don't make as much when other organizations uh, bring someone in. We basically get extra tech hours and the rent. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a service for our members. And they, so that's, they do a lot of fundraising with that. So mm -hmm. uh, we don't make the amount of money we normally would make, but we still get to bring some cool shows and they're happy about it. Pretty much the same with golf tournaments. Yeah. Oh, oh exactly the same. Yeah. It is still it is still a challenge that a balance though bringing in more there's still only so many people willing to buy the tickets and yeah. they'll only buy so many twenty five dollar right. yeah. tickets if you so, if you've only got twenty five percent of your population right. regularly buying tickets that yeah. at that's some right. point you're going to saturate the crowd right. that's right got it okay. adding on to larry's question if i'm looking at these numbers here okay uh let's just take the three-piece band for okay probably 15 a little over 1500 feet the three pieces 850 yeah. 885 well, I got you yeah okay. um, and that comes with 12 tech hours mm -hmm. so beyond that what other costs are there and then if it's if it's a non POA event <coughs> I mean is that your revenue is the 8, 885 and that's it that would be it 885 um, uh, tech hours when it says 12 tech hours yeah. that would be Dakota and Paul both and so every hour is two hours it adds up pretty quick mm -hmm. so we make those additional tech hours and that's it now what we're proposing to make now is uh, making a little bit of money selling these tickets also again in the past we've eaten that 15 to 20 thousand dollars a year now we're trying to we're planning on again making four thousand instead of spending 15 to 20 and it's been a while since I've been there but uh, do they still do concessions in there? We have a bar. We don't sell food, but oh, okay. we do have a bar. Okay. Just well, just a question. This may be a stupid one. No, go ahead. But, uh, when you rent with, if somebody does say uh, run, uh, the Washita room or a room at Coronado, and there's no setup or teardown fee, 
they only do it for an hour. Do we end up losing money on that hour? Because I think bringing someone in, you don't bring yeah. them in for an hour. No, we don't. No, typically, we have a staff there that, that works. I mean, those, cleaning these buildings clean is a constant. You can't yes. just show up only when we have events. So generally, there's people there. I mean, obviously, we would lose money if we didn't charge people on the weekends or after hours. Okay. But that's why we, we're keeping that charge there. But during the day, we may lose just a little bit because someone is coming in for two hours. But it's a minimum two hour. And they can always okay. find something to do around these buildings. There is a minimum two hour, at least. That helps a For our, our staff. We don't yeah. pay, I don't pay anybody an hour. I pay them at least two hours, and they can find something. But the meeting can okay. only be an hour. It's an hour minimum on meetings. Okay, so the yeah. Would you think it would dramatically decrease usage if you made it a two-hour minimum? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. We're just in, a question. I mean, with the churches that are giving away free rooms and trademark on the street giving away free rooms, yeah, it's yeah. tough. And then the churches ask for donations, which ends up costing them more, <laughs> but they don't recognize that. It doesn't make sense, but yes, I understand. I didn't have anything else. For All right. Moving on to the library. Library, basically with the numbers that we that we had in this last calendar year, we're making about $24,400 at the library, and we're not proposing any changes at that. We made some pretty major changes not too long ago there. Uh, it's a, it kind of is what it is. And then on the fitness and outdoor pool, we... We really couldn't see a reason to raise prices on this. Reason being on annual, the fitness center membership at 450, it just, you can't raise it more. That's already an expensive membership for a fitness center. Again, all the big ones that, that I've, I've worked at at other places, I mean, it was 350, 360 yeah. for like 24 hour fitness level kind of stuff. Yeah. So we're already priced so there's really no way to raise, already, to raise that. You've already priced the convenience feature into the pricing, so you probably can't go a whole lot there. There you go. Really, the, the biggest thing that we could do to try to increase revenue is to continue to try to push our insurance uh, program. Again, the problem with the insurance program is it's always going to get you. You're going to convince someone to go to insurance who was paying the annual. So now they're not paying the annual, they're paying the insurance. So it's always, a you know, it's, it's tough. When we're trying to sell our insurance to the people we see in the door, the people seeing the door have already paid. We have to be able to get the word out to people we're not seeing in the door, which is, we get it out there. It's just, it's, a, it's hard to talk somebody into working out. The problem with the, the insurance is it's included in their premium, so there's no real incentive to continue to show up, and we only get paid by the insurance per visit if they show back up. Sure. So it's not like we're guaranteed like an annual. We, we get paid per visit. So it's, yeah, it's hard like, to count on it. Sounds like a little cross marketing with the local orthopedists, yeah, and, uh, <laughs> physical therapists, and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I got it. I think we get like three dollars a visit, between three and three dollars and twenty-five cents a visit. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and then the outdoor pool. Again, we simplified that just five or six months ago, where it's just two dollars or four dollars, and then the uh, the annual membership I believe is only a hundred. Uh, for what our the outdoor pool has to officer offer, I think these are fair prices. Any questions on this? I know we're running out of time. We've got about 15 minutes left. Oh, no, we've got, we got about, we about 40. Oh, I thought we had it till 2.30. No, 3 o'clock. Oh. We're going we're gonna to tell about 10 to 3, probably. Okay. That's slow, I think. But. Oh, you're right. Uh, about a half hour. You're right. I got two twenty. I'm looking at the clock on the wall. It's just ten minutes slow, but we still got about a half. Hour. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next is Jason. Okay. 
Brad Merritt, this is the lakes manager, and he went through all of the um, proposed fees and made CPI increases to all of them uh, accordingly. And down at the bottom, we also did a more in-depth look at the cost of actually applying um, aquatic herbicide and actual true costs of it. So you kind of did like a cost of service study on that and made the proposal suggested there as well uh, as far as the fees. I didn't realize we actually do. Do we actually do that for people? Uh -huh. The herbicides. So basically, if they call up and say, "I've got, I've got stuff filling in in my code or something like that," we come out and spray or something. Yeah, it's you know it's pretty important that you know there's a cost balance here too. At the same time, we really don't want to encourage people to go rogue and throw uh, chemicals out into our lakes that aren't. Uh, aquatic, you know, herbicide approved type, you know, it's safe for the fish, safe for the, the environment. And, um, and so we still want to control that and manage that very well, but still charge a, a reasonable service cost for that. That's something that we started, I believe, at the end of 19 or the beginning of 20 uh, when they first started doing this application and providing that service. And it's grown since then. I didn't, I didn't realize that was a service we provided. It sounds like a really good idea. How much do you all do each year? How much do we do every year? How much of these, this do you do each year? Um, it, it does, it's pretty time consuming. They do it in the morning. We do, you know, about every morning they're out there doing a lot. I don't know the, the amount of I'd cost. I'd have to run, run a report that, to get you the total that, that they've done. Um, but I do know it is, it picked up quite drastically from the time of inception. Mm -hmm. Especially with a lot of the dredging and stuff that takes place, I think in between a lot of them, you know, hey, I've got a little bit of stuff and the weeds are growing, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they'll come out and take mm -hmm. care of it. It certainly seems reasonable, but I don't know enough about it, but it seems reasonable to keep your shoreline clean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, each of our staff are, are certified, have the certifications with the mm -hmm. state, the Arkansas State Plan Board to apply that type of herbicide, and uh, they have the equipment, mm -hmm. so they are equipped. To do it properly as well. Yeah. yeah, I think you'd be much more reasonable than the third party provider for a service like this. Absolutely. Exactly. Is it the type of thing that's done a certain time of the year, or is that an advantage? I will look at the cost savings of grouping it. I mean, it's easier to do an entire lake than this person's this day and this person, I would guess. We, we, is, we is do address good? entire lakes when we have algae blooms and things like that, but this is more of an individual's shoreline, um, that, that lower shoreline herbicide application is specific to the lot and you do that just on demand they yes if they grouped them say in march or april or mm -hmm. january whatever date whatever would that be a cost savings to would it be easier for the lakes to do whatever yeah, it, 500 well, feet of shoreline you know, versus you'd have to keep five, it up. in order to get that type of savings you'd have to kind of group them all up and then do a bulk order on chemicals and, and we don't have everyone ordering at the same time or, or wanting their, their areas treated at the same time. So okay. it, it is kind of a, it, it, and it does take some time. Uh, so it, yeah. right now, this is, I think this is the best way to address this individually, okay. and the, but down the road, we might be able to do Just annual like, routine monthly. You know, we, we have pre-scheduled treatments. Yeah. That would be the way that we could do that in a, a larger scale and something we might start talking about at the yeah. Lakes Committee. I'm, I'm just kind of look at if you could, you know, you might get a one, I mean, any discount makes people jump all over it. Sure. If, you all, if DeSoto signed up in March, it would be this fee. Mm -hmm. a little bit of a discount if all of Balboa signed up this month and it seems to me it'd be easier for the staff but I, I like know. I like your idea I, I want to run it by the the committee about guaranteed a, a certain you know like if they sign up for next year and every month we send our staff out there and they treat what they see and they keep it kind of like kind of like your landscapers coming back every month or every yes. week to keep the greens yeah. just right that might be something we could do and it's more coordinated and planned and you can keep you know the chemicals uh, on on the shelf for that so it's a great idea i think we'll we won't run it by the committee do you buy your chemicals like one time a year or do you buy them as needed it's really kind of as needed um as if we you, gear up we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep a, a minimum on the shelf for the mm -hmm. spot quick treatments but then we try to gear up as as we get orders if you have an idea you i'm assuming you've done it for a few years or more mm -hmm. you kind of have an idea of how much you do could you get a discount on the chemicals if you're buying all up front, mm -hmm. or is there a shelf life on it? 
Those are all very good questions that I, I will run by the, the lake manager and use in our future planning. If it's like golf at all, there's so many different chemicals for so many different things that uh, mm -hmm. hey, you can do bulk for the, the typical stuff that you've got, but it's so atypical a lot of times you can't do that. And there there is a shelf life on that stuff. Okay. Yeah, there's probably some risk associated with maintaining inventory of it too. If something starts to leak, it might not be good. But fair question to ask. Mm -hmm. Curiosity question, not related to the fee schedule, but the when we get to the budget line, I'll be interested to see where the herbicide treatment shows up in the budget somewhere. <laughs> didn't I didn't realize we were doing that because I didn't see it. It wasn't jumping up and down and waving at me, I guess, when we looked at the budget last time. Okay. I don't have any questions there unless anybody else does. I, I just have really a, another question, unrelated to fees or something, just more practice question. Do you have to be the property owner of that section to be able to request that be treated, or can no. I yes. say, hey, can you treat that? No, it, it, we only treat it's right in front of your property. We do not treat common property frontages because that's for the fishermen. You know, we got fishermen out there that want the vegetation and want the growth, and it's, it's conducive to, to fish habitat. And then we have our property owners that want pool, crystal clear frontage on their lot. So it's kind of a competing interest at times okay. that you need a lake manager to manage that. So common property would include like a drainage that comes down into the mm -hmm. lake that y'all wouldn't treat? We wouldn't, no, we wouldn't treat it, but we would manage it if it was yeah. a nuisance or something. It's just curiosity mm -hmm. question. Good question. We'll go on to the next. Mm -hmm. I think I think we'll start. Uh, a flip to utilities. So initially we started out, you know, we listened to the frat committee and we were, we were trying to mirror the 5.8% inflationary increase and then we were we were uh, guided to do three and a half and we, we've settled at 4%, I believe is, is okay on most of our increase for uh, regular monthly fees. So the sanitation residential curbside rate is going up to from 1640 to 1706. The residential sanitation curbside for a second container, there is still discussion on this, it was recommended to discharge a, a full curbside price. Uh, staff had discussed and we reduced it to half, roughly around $9. My committee, Public Services Committee, still recommends full price. So it, it's going to be, we're at, we're, this covers our costs, um, but that was right now where staff is at, is reducing that second container cost. Is, is this like a second 64 or 96? It's gallon exactly a, a second complete container, the same size as the first one that you have. Wow, somebody generates a lot of trash. Yeah, we think it's a good one. Two 96 gallon mm -hmm. containers of trash is a lot of trash. Well, maybe some of the rentals need it. Well, that might be nice. <laughs> with, with, you're saying one, one, <coughs> one container full of beer cans. And, you know, one of these days we will try to improve our recycling on cardboard, but we are seeing a lot more boxes, a lot more delivery to home, you know, things. The world's going that direction. So we're having more uh, trash uh, refuse that we're having to deal with. So the, some people already know that and, and are going to be having a second container to cover that next year. Um, no change on the sanitation at house, $35 a month. We did add... For the next line is residential sanitation at house with 20% medical disability discount per month. That was that carried over from last year. There was some discussion from the board to try to provide some discount to the medically disabled here in our group. And so if they show general proof that they are disabled and cannot push that sanitation cart to the curb, um, we'll give them a 20% discount mm -hmm. on that. Rest is 4% uh, increases or no change to all of the uh, commercial fees for sanitation. Same thing on the water rates. Uh, just to note, the residential monthly base rate at, at 17.29 showing a 4% CPI increase. That is actually still behind what our cost of service study uh, recommended for us to have this year. You know, if you remember a while back, we did a cost of service for our rate study. And if we were sticking to that plan, it'd be around 1764. Not too far behind, but 
But uh, just even though we're increasing the rate, we're still kind of behind plan if we were sticking to our that plan in some area. And that's just something to note. Okay. Um, can, I, can I interrupt? Can we go back to residential sanitation, the 1706? Um, I guess I would ask staff to consider a couple of points of view. Number one, part of the pitch of the new sanitation trucks was to save expenses. I, I, it kind of feels to me that increasing expenses um, kind yeah. of is a little bit counter to that message. Uh, the second issue is, and this is a, kind of a hard issue to bring up, the total revenues for garbage pickup, as reported, is about 1.7 million a year. The total expense is about 900,000 a year. <clears throat> Very roughly, we have a positive margin of almost 100% of expenses. Mm -hmm. um, I just wonder what kind of message so increasing that yeah. particular line is, so you, given those two points of view. Where this kind of goes back there for, for, for many, many years, and I don't want to get started, but sanitation is a revenue generator. They operate that, that business very efficiently, and it generates anywhere from 800000 to a million dollars of net mm -hmm. revenue. They take that money, it's still in the public works department, and they use that to lower your subsidy in the street mm -hmm. department. So mm -hmm. basically, and, 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 and as of years in the past, our only road budget or pavement repair budget was the revenue that was being generated by the sanitation department. So if we generated, you know, eight hundred thousand dollars to a million a million dollars a year in net revenue, that's what was basically budgeted for road and culvert replacements mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. for the past year. So that's the relationship mm -hmm. there. Um, and that's kind of been the goal is to try to maintain that that level of, of revenue until mm -hmm. you know someday hopefully a, you know assessment increase or something like that can can cover that. Mm -hmm. um, the and you're we also, did. You're also in line with your other counterpart cities and, mm -hmm. and around here too. That yeah, our prices are thing. very competitive, and yet we uh, you know we we do a very good efficient operation of that. And we do have our struggles uh, obviously with staffing and, and equipment. Thus the reason why we're trying to go to the new the new sanitation program. And I do recall, you know, saying when we did our business plan, we, we didn't think we would need to raise rates at all to cover that new sanitation plan. At that time, that was before the staffing issues started to occur. And and as a reflection of what FRAT recognized and the board has recognized is that staffing is another dynamic issue to, to our equation of, of being, fin I guess, financially responsible. And so I would say you know, reluctantly, but I think responsibly, we went ahead and put a small increase to that sanitation fee because keep in mind that 5.8% CPI has already happened. We're already, you know, it's, it's already, we're already kind of behind on trying to catch up with that inflationary increase for a year. And we still predict that we're probably in that kind of mode. So I th rather than get further behind on that revenue and further decrease the amount of uh, potential assessment revenue, trying to keep that assessment revenue, excuse me, the subsidy for streets low, we uh, went ahead and proposed to do that 4%, mainly for operational and staffing, not the, not the truck, not the sanitation program. Well, on the at house, you looked the same. You yeah. Promised no change prematurely. The, uh, I'm gonna take off one hat and put on another hat, which, goes to exactly what you said. When I look at 4% CPI increase, my first reaction is, why not 5.8? <laughs> so. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you, you, okay. you could, you could. We, we, were just, we just got directed to, yeah. uh, in uh, kind of in the utility section to kind of keep our utility rate increase down to four. Well, historically, we have always said, we had a study, it said 3%. The utility rates have been increased by 3% lately. Over the first couple of years, it was way more than 3%. But we kind of codified, rightly or wrongly, that our philosophy was the utility rates at 3%. It seemed to me that the 4% just was the old 3% scooched up and then applied to a mm -hmm. bunch of line items. No, and, I, and I'm saying the rules have changed. That's it. We, we have a new, a new year. A new future, really. 
And my first reaction when I saw 4% was, yeah, why not 5 8? What you as staff recommend, I think we on this committee have a tremendous amount of respect for. I'm not going to fight 4%. I'm just telling you when I first looked at it, mm -hmm. it's my, my, my gut reaction was maybe more aggressive, but I'm, 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 I'm fine with 4. I was just curious as to where the four came from. That's all. And, and, and you know, it could continue, you mm -hmm. know, for years to come until we, we, you know. And you did a nice job covering both sides of the street there. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> they, these are complicated issues. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to pay more for fees. I don't want to pay more for fees. <laughs> but let's get real. Mm -hmm. We need the funds. And so, yes, that's speaking out of both sides. Of the I mind. got it. That's good. We need that. We're, we're, we're definitely open to the yeah, committee's recommendation. If you'll back us on that, we'll, we'll go with it, of yeah. course. But we're trying to yes, I understand. You know, read the... I think, I think at least at the moment, Jason, you're probably in about the right place. Yeah. I mean, bottom, bottom line on that, I think you're at the right place. You certainly could have said 5.8, ratcheted everything up. Since we're coming up on an assessment vote, you know, not being quite as aggressive as you potentially could be mm -hmm. is probably not a bad thing, you know, from a from a public relations standpoint. Did have a question though. Uh, you were talking about the cost of service plan. Help me understand what's in that cost of service plan because we you I, I heard what you were saying that it's you're behind your cost of service plan projection, but then I also heard you say that sanitation is a revenue net revenue generator for the community. So I'm trying to reconcile the two comments. Two different departments. The cost of service study was for water and sewer. Mm -hmm. Okay, that excuse was, me. That's what that was for. Okay, okay, thank you. So related to that, then are we? Are we behind and getting further behind from a cost of service plan standpoint, or are we are we holding are we holding about the same ratio, or are we catch fully catching up? I, I think you, you I mean analogy here. Rather than winning the race, you're going to place third, but you're in the game. We're, we're in the race. We're we're getting a little bit behind, mm -hmm. but we're not out of the out of the race. So not nowhere. As long as we do an increase of, of some reasonableness this year, we're not going to get, we're not going to have to do a, a bigger increase next year if we have to do an increase. So we're kind of keeping up. Okay. Yeah. So kind of, kind of what I'm taking away from that is, yeah, we're a little behind the cost of service plan. There's kind of a long-term strategy here of an incremental increase to start, start whittling into how far behind we are against that plan and. Exactly. At some point in the future, three, four, five years down the line, whatever that whatever that timeline is, you know, the desire would be to get us back to a one-to-one -one ratio with our cost mm -hmm. of service. I mean, I mean, you would when you predict there's going to be some type of inflation rate for 2021 that we'll yeah. see reflected next year, mm -hmm. and so rather than having two years of 5.8 percent, you know, possibly, we're keeping up, you know. In the four percent, and next year we maybe only still might be a three, maybe another four percent, and we're you know we can adjust, okay. make a minor adjustments rather than large adjustments. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. This may be the world's stupidest question, but since we're converging the sanitation things, if someone has a second uh, receptacle, are they automatically billed for pickup of two of them? Or the first one would be the 1706 and the second one would be nine dollars. Oh, what if they don't put the second one out? What if they don't put the second one out? It's, it's a fixed yes. fee. Okay, and it's they're they're clear on that. We we will be making that clear as we get into the education phase. Okay. Uh, in, in, I, I, in November, I see that December. As a potential difficulty. Yeah. But once once the budget and the, the vote is all done, we will be into the education mode on our sanitation program before the end of the year. That's why we don't think they'll be very. Well, that's what I was going to ask, Is because I'd recommend kind of splitting the difference and make them pay for three quarters for the second one. Mm -hmm. But there's probably not that many to have two of them, are there? I wouldn't think so. Okay. Told you it was a stupid question. That was 96 question. gallons. That's what well, I wouldn't think so. Uh, where were we? Uh, you were heading down water rates. The, the first, next couple of okay. the well, water rates. years were the... Meter box replacement, meter tampering, looks like some new... Yeah, new now those are, those are pretty big changes. Um, actually, those are brand new ones. The meter box, the meter and the meter box replacement. 
The meters in the future will, will cost more than the meters that we're using today, but that's, that's coming down the road. So we're starting that, we're starting this process. And in the process, when you put out a meter in a new box and the, and the house is still under construction, if the contractor drives over that meter box and destroys it, we have to play, replace it. And we've been absorbing that cost in the past and we want us to be able to have some type of feed to be able to charge a contractor by. So that's the starter for that. Mm -hmm. The meter tampering and theft of water service, which sometimes it just kind of comes in surges. We'll have a lot of it and then we won't have any for a while. Mm -hmm. These are folks that will come in and cut the lock off the meter and damage the meter mm -hmm. and then steal the water. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're wanting to, uh, you know, we were, we were around $250 uh, for that, but we've ramped it up to 500 to, to send a message Sure. To uh, to folks here that please you do not want to steal water here and, and and or destroy our our meters because in the future they will be getting more expensive. Yeah, no, both of those sound perfectly reasonable. No changes on the others. Um, we did ask that fit the, on the new cross connection uh, backflow preventer annual inspection and report. We put fifty dollars in. We are sending our staff to get certified in that inspection as the board just approved that policy last uh, week or so and so the residents will have an option they can hire a plumber or a certified inspector or they can hire the staff person if we have someone certified at the time to go out there and do that and that would be our basic fee for a staff person to go out there and probably spend less than two hours to to complete that inspection and turn in a report okay so this is an expectation that over some period of time, all of the property owners would have to go down this path. They'd have to. If you have a, if you have an irrigation system, you're required annually to do provide a certified inspection and submit that report to our office. We have to keep it on file and keep record of it, so we can we get audited every two years by the state. Okay. On that. So curiosity question, just because I happen to have this scenario, I know some people draw their irrigation from. Our water. Some people draw their irrigation from from lakes. Is it the same requirement regardless of source, or is it only tied to the water system? Only tied to our water system, so we can protect our water system from any potential backflow contamination. Okay. Now, now getting any... water from the lakes is absolutely free. Mm -hmm. We don't have a fee for that. Yeah. Yet, but no, we don't have a fee for that yet. Gotcha. One question: um, In a previous neighborhood I lived in, it used to be you had to. Do like what you're proposing. Hire your plumber. You hired the POA. Mm -hmm. um, it became a mess to manage, so they essentially went to. And this is the water company, so it was not necessarily a POA, but they went to the water. The water company said, "We're going to inspect it all, so we can manage it better." Is there? Any concerns there just about trying to manage? I, I think you could lead to that someday, and this yeah. is the foundation, a foundational okay. step, because if we were to provide that service for everybody here in the village, mm -hmm. it would take a person's uh, six yeah. months to yeah. complete yeah. all those inspections, uh, but that fee would cover their cost, and then we'd have a, a, another staff be able to do mm -hmm. other things for six months throughout the year. So it's right. a good idea. We're just not ready to take that step yet. Yeah. You have to look at the cost of managing if half of everybody use their own plumber right and check all that so um does that include the, jason does that include drip systems that are just a hose attached to your do they need this is just for my personal use does well, that need a i know it was inspected for i think backflow at one time but is that an annual thing now that's new it is an annual thing, and if, if you're using a drip system tied to your hose bib on your house, you, they do make a screw-on backflow preventer okay. for that, and that'll be part of our education process. Okay. Now that would not be inspected or part of this inspection. It's usually the bigger contraption right there by the the meter, uh, but we would be providing information to homeowners to incorporate that into their usage for an outside you know, okay. additional protection. Okay. Wastewater fees. Just a 4% increase across the board there. Mm -hmm. uh, new is the stormwater, and then this is this is something for, for consideration. A stormwater management and a POA culvert infrastructure fee that would be a monthly tied to the water bills for uh, developed lots. For every dollar per meter generates, you know, another $109,000 uh, a year in new revenues. And you, you could, you could, and we, a lot of cities treat their stormwater as a utility function, you know, 
Um, and that's why it's worded in such, in such that way. We thought it would be a good idea to go ahead and have a fee base set there and, and get that established so that the board could consider using that as a revenue source uh, down the road if, they, if needed to help fund their culvert repair uh, programs. Mm -hmm. The other things here, um, did we want to talk about this utility shutoff uh, fee, Karina? Um, we can talk about it. Um, yeah, you're talking about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I talked to Carrie and Donna again this morning about it. Uh, let, I, me, let me set it up for you. I, I stumbled on this uh, earlier this year. I didn't know what was happening, but people that... Uh, turn their water off that go for a couple of months or three months or even six months that turn their water off the house. Mm -hmm. They don't get billed anything now. Mm -hmm. And we have an ambulance fee and a, a street light fee on there, and that goes to zero, too. Mm -hmm. And I asked them if they could just charge those fees and keep that going when they, they cut it off. And our, our system is so cumbersome that we have to get help in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. But Jason brought up a good point, is why we don't have a minimum fee for uh, for the water being, we're still servicing it while they're gone, uh, why, we, why we don't have a minimum. So we came up with a minimum fee for everything, for all three of those things. So when they turn off the water, instead of it going to zero, it would go to the 3484 that you've got there. But that would include the ambulance fee, the streetlight fee, and uh, the charges for the, the the service while you're gone. Oh, that's what that is. So if, if you were to still charge the ambulance fee and the streetlight fee and propose one half your sanitation base fee, one half your water base, and one half your wastewater base, it'd be $159.80 a month, roughly $160 a month. A month and, or a billing? Pardon? A month or a billing? Uh, on the water and sewer and sanitation, that's monthly. On these here, the ambulance is bi monthly, excuse me. So that needs to be actually further reduced. Um, that number is going to be quite a bit. It's going to be quite a bit less. It's going to be reduced by forty, fifteen, by fifty-five dollars. So it's roughly a hundred bucks. Yeah. We'll let you, we can let you work the math offline. Mm -hmm. I think I understand where you're going with that. And I mean, I don't. At first blush, that's not necessarily unreasonable. You know, I think you know. To your, to your point, you're still providing all the services. Even though somebody doesn't happen to see, you know, while you're gone, I'm still maintaining your water treatment plant. So when you come back, you got a working water. Same thing on the wastewater treatment plant, yeah. and I'm maintaining your roads. So when you come back, sanitation trucks can drive on them. So, okay. yeah, uh, you know, there's something to consider about fairness, and uh, and we'd like to. Yeah. You know, We're still exploring fair. it, but we want to throw it out. Yeah. 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 We've well, got to see if it's a viable option in the system. But if so, if it's something you guys would agree mm -hmm. with or not. Yeah. I think it makes perfect sense. I don't see anything that would make me say no. The only, the only thing I don't know what I don't know that we'd probably have to cross check with either some of the local communities and or our, our legal counsel, make sure that we're mm -hmm. not doing something that could potentially and get we us on the gun sites. But moving on, then no change really on the ambulance fee. We did propose a four percent increase on the street light fee. Mm -hmm. Um, rest, rest of these here, for example, are to establish a basis for if we encounter these scenarios, we have a means to charge um, commercial customers or, or whoever. Mm -hmm. So commercial wastewater tank pump and panel service calls uh, per material cost only um, be per event, basically. So if we have some of the commercial facilities here in the village, they are responsible for their own wastewater treatment lift stations. Mm -hmm. So folks like... Um, Mount Carmel and Good Sam, they have these, these large lift stations. Um, if they call us to come out there and, and do maintenance on it or fix things, we just basically charge them material costs. We don't charge them any labor uh, on things like that. Uh, and that would just be a material cost reimbursement fee. Mm -hmm. Wastewater repair fee for damages to system. If we have a contractor come in and damage one of our grinder pumps that we just installed at a new home, for example, just like a meter fee, if they drive over that new simplex home grinder pump mm -hmm. fee, um, we'd like to be reimbursed for that. Yeah. Relocation fee. In some cases, a lot of these homes here built their house and they put the simplex grinder pump in, and then they decide to build this big porch or this big grand backyard and need to relocate that little home simplex grinder pump system. So 
without any, any basis, what we'd like to be able to do is simply charge the property owner the cost of reinstalling a, a new one, because uh, most of the time you can't really salvage a lot of what was already there, or it's a different type of system. That gives us a basis for that. Sometimes we can salvage materials, sometimes we can't, so we just put down material costs. Repair fee for damage and theft to wastewater lift station facilities. I guess I said that already. Um, that may be duplicate uh, of the above statement there. A dumping fee of our wastewater treatment plant per truck load any size. For example, the porta potty systems here that we have at all our rec facilities have a lot of porta potties. That that waste manager manages and empties all of those and maintains those porta potties. It'd be much easier for them to haul that to our wastewater treatment plants and dump it for a fee than haul it all the way to Hot Springs or Mountain Pie. It's not a lot of it's not a lot of uh, business, so to speak, but it, it does um, help serve that clientele that is serving our community here make it a little easier and provides a basis for that I would seems like a reasonable idea as long as long as you're recovering a reasonable amount of money to cover it cover the overhead associated with supporting it seems like a good idea the city of hot spring I think charges $25 or so ours is a little bit more because mm -hmm. uh, we're a little smaller but they don't have to drive the truck all the way to hot springs and drive it back so. yeah. 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 so if they have a choice Okay, that covers all of our utility in, fees. In some cases, you said we're charging just or the proposal is materials cost only, but it, in mm -hmm. some cases, it seemed reasonable to charge some labor cost. Uh, again, my, my committee recommends we charge labor okay. everything um, right. uh, for our, our stuff. A lot of these folks here, our commercial customers, are paying their water and sewer rate at a higher fee, and those those utility rates cover our labor costs, uh, you know, for our staff on a yearly basis. Um, so I, we have we have an argument, uh, so to speak, you know, that on every project we should charge our labor and material costs, um, or we just charge material costs since our labor is already paid for by another by utility fund. So it gets kind of goes back and forth. Um, we're trying to keep things cheap and reasonable, but fair to to our clients here, and so that's just. FYI, that's for sure. information there. So I think the, uh, I also understand you may, depending on the accounting system, you may or may not have an accurate accounting of just how much labor was expended in a particular category. So without without the ability to get an accurate map of how many hours were actually expended fixing a particular problem, you may have a little trouble billing for it. But the other the other one would be, again, don't, don't know what I don't know. Uh, don't know if that potentially puts us in any kind of legal legal jeopardy for double billing or anything like that. So be something that would have to be looked into. I also have a few fees on the P and I um, permitting inspection schedule that I'd like to cover. Mm -hmm. um, see, all these are permits here that that Charlie Brown can, can discuss with you on. But under road and utility service connection fees, electrical fees, um, we propose to go up four percent. On that, that's for all new homes who come in and reimburse the PLA for their electrical infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, investment. New home roadway fee goes up from 1500 to 1560 That covers for road repairs and a uh, sizing of the culverts for the driveways. Mm -hmm. Increase on the new home water and sewer force main services. So that's new water, new sewer, 24, 2500 Went from 24 to 2500 there. On the grinder pumps, it's going up from 55 to 5,720. Again, uh, just making a note here, uh, my committee, we don't charge any um, labor costs on that. That's just material costs uh, on that fee. And then the other is duplex, a duplex grinder pump, it was just like two home units right next to each other. That'll serve like a dental office or uh, like a, a small commercial business. Mm -hmm. uh, our Sanitation policies are, are drafted up right there, and it's a recommendation in the future that all commercial facilities have a two-pump sewer system. That way, if one pump goes out, we don't have to shut their water off. They can stay in business while they get, and they got a second pump to keep it rolling. That's normal practice throughout everywhere, and um, and so that's something we're proposing here for that. Also, we're also proposing, for example, we are expecting to see a lot more development come here down the road lodges, subdivision developments, all kinds of exciting things coming. And in those developments, there's usually a lift station 
uh, involved in that work. And so we'll be working with those developers to use their engineer to design that lift station, and they can install it themselves under our supervision, or they can pay the POA to install it. Uh, either way, I just kind of want to have that ability to, to have some basis to charge, and that would include labor plus materials plus 15% for overhead expenses and things like that. Uh, new commercial lift station excuse me, commercial maintenance lift station maintenance service annual membership service renewal something that, that the health department really really promotes is is providing service to our commercial um, companies to have their own lift stations and what we're proposing is for five hundred dollars a year we'll send a staff out there once a month to inspect their lift station check things and give them a, a report on what needs to be fixed or maintained and a cost. And again, if they want us to do that, we'll do it at, at um, that just material costs, or they can go hire their own person to come in and fix it. But it increases the responsibility as a water purveyor to these these uh, commercial entities, having a reliable sewer 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 treatment or sewer conveyance system on the other side. We are seeing the state crack down on water purveyors who don't pay attention to that, yeah. and so this is providing them it's a voluntary service for that if they want that. If they don't get that, then we will charge them labor costs if they ask us to, to, uh, to work sure. on that. Well, absolutely. Yeah. Commercial lift station maintenance and service for a non-member, it's cost plus. We're gonna charge $150 an hour for labor, materials and expenses plus 15%. And so that's, that just provides us a baseline on how we're gonna charge anybody and everybody who is, is not a member of that uh, service plan. Two, two inch water services, 4% increase. increase. So Jason, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to stop right there because we're about to time out on this room. Okay. So I think we managed to get through the vast majority of the fee schedule, which was goodness. Uh, I think I'd like to ask my team if they have any, if looking through the rest of this, they have any questions. It looks like for the most part, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. There aren't a whole lot of, whole lot of other changes that are that are left in here. I think there's a couple here related to uh, looks like probably uh, ambulance and animal control and things like that. But I think we can we'll look through the rest of it. If we have any questions, we'll reach back. Um, it, it looks like there's not anything for the rest of permitting and inspections. Um, and then I didn't make police and fire come since they only had just a few. So I'll spend two seconds and just go over that. Okay. Um, the false alarm is the only thing that's gone up, mm -hmm. and that's by the 5.8 increase. There hasn't been any change over the last several years. Mm -hmm. Then I just rounded it to a whole figure yep. to make keep it simple. Mm -hmm. There was no change on the fire reports and accidents and stuff and the fire service fee mm -hmm. because they really don't issue any of those, but we didn't want to eliminate them just in case the need for them in the future. Sure. Um, for sure. So that's the only reason you have changes there. Mm -hmm. The rest of it are state mandated for pricing. Mm -hmm. And then your animal registration, I think. Um, Smaller versions. Yeah, uh, Charlie did, did increase those. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Charlie? Animal registration? Yes. Yeah. But no. it's very small changes yeah. though, for the most part. Mm -hmm. So that sums up your. Mm -hmm. All of your fees. Okay. There was no changes, though, right? Very, very little. We added one at the very bottom. Which, oh, okay. Yes, I apologize. The compliance boat ramp violation. If you guys want. Yes, currently that boat ramp violation falls under our uh, overall declaration of current and fine, which is one hundred and fifty dollars for one single. Mm -hmm. According to the declaration, we felt that that was a little bit excessive for a boat ramp violation, so mm -hmm. we were proposing to move that to a, a separate uh, monetary single incurrence fine versus that $150 fine. Okay. Okay. How much, how much of that do you typically have in your world, sir? Is that that's something that's a common event or an uncommon event? or Common event. Common event? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now you got the whole thing scheduled. Okay. And in the future, get it, get used to seeing Charlie Brown and Terry Wiley because Stephanie won't be here. So get they they're very good at what they do, and they'll be able to answer your questions. Excellent. Well, thank you.
everybody for the effort that you put in. I mean, a lot of thought been given to this. You, we had a few questions, but you notice we didn't ask a lot of questions. You know, I think it's. I think you're, 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 you're on the right path. I mean, we'll have to take a look at it as a group, but I don't see anything that just leaps out at me that says there's something seriously wrong with the proposals. Uh, we'll talk about it as a group in the next few days and figure out where to go from there. But I thank you, thank you for everything. Really appreciate your time and your effort and your energy. Uh, unless anybody has any last minute items, I'd like to move to adjourn the meeting so we can clear the room for the next discussion. So, thank motion? you, guys.